we're delighted to be joined by such a fantastic panel. Um, to kick us off will be um, Jonas Fernandez, uh, a member of the uh, MEP of the Socialists and Democrats. He's a Spanish politician from the PSOE party and a member of the Europa European Parliament since 2014, uh, where he sits in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. In 2017, he was the rapporteur on the Parliament's annual resolution on the ECB. Molly Scott Cato uh, is a member of the European Parliament of the Greens Group uh, from the UK. Uh, we know each other. Um, a politician, economist, environmental and community activist, um, and, a, and a member here since 2014. She also sits on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and she focuses on sustainable finance uh, and monetary policy and tax evasion. She's currently leading the Parliament's initiative on uh, the report on sustainable finance. Then we're really pleased to have Boris Keselewski from the European Central Bank. Is that, did I get your surname okay? Great. He is the head of the ECB representation in Brussels since 2017. He's previously worked at the IMF, the Bank of Russia, the Bank of France and the ECB for many years. And finally, we're joined by Tonis Brozens, who is the senior economist covering the Eurozone economy at ING. He started his career at the Dutch Central Bank and has been with ING since 2010. Uh, he holds a MA degree in both economics and philosophy of science from Tilburg University. Um, so I'll, I'll ask in that order that you each speak for about five minutes and then we're gonna open it up to the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for, for the invitation and thank you for the public uh, for being here. Of course, for me, it's an honor to, to be part of this debate today in Brussels because I, I think that this type of debates are very, very necessary necessity to, to analyze what uh, monetary policy is implementing, what uh, monetary policy is thought, and how at a European level we will have to reanalyze or to rethink uh, our uh, monetary and financial financial framework. I, I think that activities and NGOs as uh, positive money is really needed because we as uh, rule makers in the, in the parliament, Molly and myself in the parliament, we will have to discuss every day and we will have to debate and to approve and, and to discuss with other colleagues trying to improve uh, the current uh, monetary system, the, the current monetary framework. And I think that activities and NGOs as positive money could do another work. Maybe the work to dream no, in another horizon, the work to, to think in another, in another work, in another system. And we have to understand each other what our role is in the parliament, at least uh, my role in the parliament as a member of uh, a socialist and democrats group, and the role of uh, activities or NGOs as positive, no, as uh, positive money, trying to influence in our work, trying to uh, create uh, opinion, trying to to open new debates at uh, a European level. So, uh, for these reasons, uh, I think that this seminar. Uh, is uh, important, it's very, very important for us. In any case, as I said to you before, uh, in the parliament, at least in, in my group, uh, we will try to improve uh, the current uh, monetary system, the current uh, financial system. And in this work, uh, we will try to complete, as you know, the banking union. We will try to launch uh, a capital market union we will try to negotiate with other members in the parliament and with the council how we could improve the current uh, Eurozone. And part of the debates, part of the ideas that my colleague uh, Miguel Angel from Spain uh, has explained today is uh, the debate uh, for another agenda. No, it's the debate for a dramatic change in the current system. And, and I think that there are at least two spheres no, in the debate, how we could improve the current system and how we could think in another, in another model in which we, we can work, we can work towards it. Uh, in any case, as uh, our uh, presenter said, in last year, uh, I had the opportunity to work in the draft report of the parliament with uh, Molly as a shadow reporter of Greens to analyze what uh, ECB uh, did in the previous year and how the ECB could work or could work more 
uh, more properly or more, uh, you know, more close to the problems that we uh, analyze in, in the parliament. In, in, this, in this report that we passed uh, last year, uh, with a broad majority, by the way, supported by EPP and ALDE, but also supported by Greens, and with the, with the abstention of uh, UE, uh, in this report we tried to cover part of the debates that we had had today. In, in one of the paragraphs uh, in this, in this uh, draft report uh, approved uh, by the Parliament, uh, we, uh, we asked to the ECB to diversify the theoretical background underlying the policy framework within uh, central banks. Of course, this is only a sentence, a very, very general sentence, but it's not, it was not easy to introduce in an agreement, you know, in the negotiation with other groups, the idea that the current, the current theoretical framework could have to be uh, re reanalyzed with uh, new ideas. In some way, in, in another part of the, of, the, of the test and with the support, of course, of, uh, of Molly, uh, we introduced the idea that the ECB uh, is bound by uh, the Paris Agreement. You know, it's true that Greens wanted more. In, in the case of my, in my group, uh, we had in the same situation, but we have to negotiate. And, and, and I think that is the first time that the parliament says clearly that the ECB will have to be considered the European agreement in the Paris Agreement. But in any case, there is one paragraph, one paragraph in the, in the, report, in the report talking on digital currency and talking on uh, digital money. And in the paragraph, uh, again, we introduce uh, the idea that the ECB and the Commission will, will have to analyze how the uh, current monetary system works and how these new uh, ideas, how these new uh, debates could be uh, taken into account in the work of the uh, monetary institutions. Yeah, So I, I think that is not, it's, it's not a lot what we uh, achieved in the in the parliament, but it's the first time that these ideas are in an official paper, supported uh, by a broad majority in the parliament, and uh, with another ideas to, in, to 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 increase the transparency, to increase accountability. For example, trying to organize a better ELA, uh, trying to uh, increase the transparency in CSPP uh, program, uh, asking for a more active and fluid uh, monetary dialogues in the, in the parliament with the ECB, uh, introducing the code of conduct uh, for the members of the governing council of the ECB. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, in the report that we passed last year, we have introduced part of these ideas, part of the spirit, part or the flavor that we have uh, smelled today in this, in this seminar. So if we understand what we have to do, as in the parliament, you as NGOs, I think that we will have uh, an important way to work. Uh, I think that there are many, many uh, points that we will have to, to rethink to, to improve uh, the monetary policy. We have to introduce another reference, for example, to analyze if the current objective of the, mon of the monetary policy is, is fine, the uh, inflection of consumer uh, goods and service, because as you know, real estate uh, are out, uh, asset price are out. So I, I think that there are many, many things to discuss, not only in the current system, we have to complete um, Eurozone, we have to reanalyze what uh, ECB is doing in the current system and how we can work towards the new system that uh, positive money uh, defends. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fran, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, as Fran said, am the Parliament's Rapporteur on Sustainable Finance, and so I've been talking to lots of audiences on financial topics for the past several months, and I think what's really struck me um, is how rapidly people's views are moving on the issue of sustainability and how we might 
readjust finance so that it achieves sustainability goals. And I actually spoke at the central bank in Amsterdam back in November. No doubt some people here were also present. And um, I looked at those notes before coming here today and it really struck me how fast the debate seems to have moved in those six months. And that's a debate, okay, that's a debate about sustainability. If you come right in and say to people there should be more political control over how money is created, then they absolutely say not. But, you know, there, there's a, I would say that's a very minority position in the parliament. And, uh, yeah, but if you come at them from the angle of saying, well, we need to reorganise, we re need to rethink the way money works in order to tackle the very serious ecological problems facing us, then suddenly you've got most people in the parliament signed up, you've got strong leadership from the commission, you've got President Macron speaking um, in favour of this agenda. So I think that there's an interesting sense in which that is um, starting to politicise the way we think about money. Um, and to me, that's, that's an interesting opportunity and a, and a way to, to get into this discussion. And I think that's something we've been able to do through my report. So I don't want to be too positive because it, it's still the case that um, there are an awful lot of people in the parliament who just automatically would revert to, you know, the central bank's role is only to, to, tack, to track inflation and it has to be completely politically independent. But um, so, so Jonas and myself and maybe Paul Tang and a few others are, are pretty isolated voices. But still, I think, um, as you said, not only coming out of the 2008 crisis, but also because of the ecological crisis, also because it's, in, it's increasingly clear that markets cannot solve ecological problems, that we need strong um, political intervention, and that perhaps the money system is really closely involved in why we're not adequately tackling those ecological issues. So to me, that's the kind of exciting aspect of the sustainable finance agenda. It really is exciting. I'm not just saying that. Um, anyway, just to come back a little bit to what Jonas was saying, um, he wrote an absolutely great report, I've got to say. We were like quite excited about that. Oh, this is such a good ECB report, but it was just, I'm afraid to say, horribly watered down in the negotiations, which was a shame. And we lost a lot of the good political content, I would say. But again, I mean, when you see a good report like that, it's getting all the people right across the parliament to sort of, um, it's challenging their views. And then you sit in the negotiations and they have to justify why they're rejecting the fact that we should have more political control over money. And once you raise that as an issue, it's actually really hard for them to argue with it. They, they don't have coherent arguments because it's an assumption. And once you challenge the assumption, then the argumentation is actually quite thin, I've found. Um, but anyway, as I said, the, the majority view is certainly that, uh, that all we're doing as, as politicians and as regulators is basically ensuring stability, you know, that we don't have a right to direct the way uh, money flows through our economies. And um, actually, as just referring to Honas's report again, our amendment to that report says that we have to have a recomposition of the portfolio of securities in order to reduce the holding of bonds linked to fossil fuel industries. Now, to me, that is completely uncontroversial. You know, why do we have our central bank creating money through QE, sending it out into the European economy and sending it in the direction of fossil fuel companies when we know that's the opposite direction from the one we need our economy to move in. But if I make a case like that, you know, to a lot of people, it would be, but the ECB is neutral. The ECB has to be neutral, but it's clearly not neutral because it's choosing which companies bonds to buy. And as it does that, it's choosing the way that money is directed. And um, in terms of what we had in, in my report, um, we had some very nice guidance from uh, colleagues of Stan, actually, at the New Economics Foundation, and of Fran as well. And they suggested that, that we should um, suggest the importance of credit guidance. Now, this, again, is sort of anathema to a lot of people, because it would suggest that, actually, you do put a certain quota on how much bank lending should be directed, say, towards uh, climate-friendly activities. Um, and we think, because we're, we're basically having an argument about whether the way to incentivize movement towards sustainability is to make the credit requirements less if you have uh, green investments compared to what they are if you have brown or, or black investments. And um, we think a much more direct way of achieving that incentive is simply to say that we should have quotas over how the, the um, how banks are required to lend. We think this would reduce the, the risk of, to financial stability from changing the credit weightings, and it would also give banks a lot of flexibility, but within certain parameters about how they lend their money. Okay, I am, okay. I'll just quickly say then that um, 
thank you for saying that. Just when I first became an MP, I launched a report about green QE and how we might um, how we might effectively use that free public money in a way that serves the social good and serves our political advantages. And I think those of us who've been in this discussion a long time can remember the absolute transformation in the debate when QE really started happening because we'd been arguing for a long time that that was how money was created and people could say, no, you're a lunatic and sideline you. But suddenly the official bank started creating money in that way. But the really sad thing is that when they did that, they did that in a way that increased inequality and didn't direct that money towards social and environmental goods. And so just to return to my original point to conclude, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm all up for arguing that we need much more control over how banks uh, first how banks create money and how money is first spent into our economy but I think it's worth considering that if you can make a strong case for the social and environmental need to shift the way money works then in a way you're sort of approaching the same goal through the back door and maybe that's more likely to to be successful and uh, next Friday the ECB turns 20 um, 20 is the time when you are extremely open-minded, so taking <laughs> the words of uh, Stan, uh, it's great to be here, and each time I can escape my central banking colleagues with a black suit like I wear, or my commission or, or council colleagues, I'm very happy also to engage with um, the public, and, um, and this indeed is something which is key and which we certainly don't do enough, but we, we, we have to do more and I will tell you a little bit what we do. Indeed, um, what actually um, is central banking about? It's about one single word, it's about trust. And trust, we, we sell trust in a way, trust through our banknotes, which is tangible, but it's trust through our monetary policy. So um, trust of the people is indeed the key indicator and um, I agree that um, through the financial crisis many things have changed also for us and coming back to Annalisa um, we are doing we are trying to um, go to do more outreach and to do a lot to talk to the public just to give you a few very concrete examples now we um, think that our wealth is the 3,000 people that work at the ECB it's our staff which, as you say, maybe not be diversified enough, and we're working on this. We have now quotas um, also for, for, for more female staff in management positions. So this is something we're working on, and, and which is really very important. But um, this uh, using staff as ambassadors of the ECB, we have now launched, for instance, a very concrete program, which is called Back to School, so each of our staff member, from the assistant to the director general, is invited to go back to his or her school in the 28 member states and to explain the ECB policies to, um, to, to um, young people. So indeed, the Euro generation is our first target and not no later than a couple of weeks ago, President Draghi again um, met young people and uh, through a webcast, um, uh, event um, for the so-called Generation Euro Students Award. He was also in Ireland with students. So this is one important target group. Be beyond that group, we also um, engage, um, try to engage in an intelligible language. It's indeed, as um, I think, uh, Fran, you said, uh, how to talk to, to my grandma. So using not the central banking language, but using simple words. This is a huge challenge. Um, our speeches are not yet to that level, but we have developed also on our website some very sort of nice um, infographics or, or, or some explanations about central banking and to make it closer to the language of our family and friends, which is um, something uh, which is not easy, but we are trying to do. Then, indeed, beyond the financial industry, with uh, which we, we dialogue naturally, um, through, through also our monetary policy operation. We have, by definition, also um, the um, dialogue with um, NGO here. For instance, myself here in Brussels, I've been here for six months. I had many exchanges with ETUC, the trade unions, that are also part of our policy um, dialogue, economic policy dialogue. It's true, it's never enough. But let me assure you that the financial crisis has also changed how we think changed how we operate, 
Um, we are trying, as you said, to use our staff also to, to, to um, explain our policies. We are changing our recruitments. I talked about um, the um, quotas for, for, for female managers, but there are many other aspects of diversity. We now have a diversity chapter. We celebrated two days ago the Idaho event. So there are many aspects of diversity beyond nationality and, and gender we, we attach um, attention to. And it is um, something close to our heart and it's indeed a structural change in central banking. It's not enough, but Annalise, we would love to you to help us to continue and, and, and all of you um, to, to also engage um, directly with us through our um, uh, Twitter dialogues with, with uh, or through our um, events. Uh, we have a new visitor center in this lovely building, which is on your, on your invitation in, in Frankfurt. Uh, we um, had uh, 20,000 people um, visiting the ECB last year, so I really invite you to come also and to, to visit us and to learn more about um, central banking taught by a young uh, central bankers um, to dialogue with you. So, so the second uh, aspect will be, will be very short. It's just on the, um, what, what Molly said on, on the sustainability, green factor. It's um, for monetary policy, the uh, legislator has given us one single mandate, is price stability in the medium term. And actually, when you look at the 20 last years, I think we are around 1.8% while we aim at uh, below, but close to 2%. So we are, I think, not bad in, in this uh, track record of 20 years. But um, so um, this is for efficiency purposes. This is also in our QE policy, um, our, our, let's say, single needle in our, in our compass. But regarding our own funds, because we have also our own uh, pension system, we invest, um, we try to invest as much as possible also in green energy and um, we also part, um, as Jonas said, of um, this uh, more general, uh, let's say, uh, you know, Paris Agreement uh, framework. And also in our monetary policy operation, um, we invest in EIB bonds and EIB is known also for, for being very green. And last but not least, our new building is the, one of the most uh, green buildings um, in, in, in the world. So you will see it when you, you come to visit us. And, and the third and last point is just about transparency and accountability. Um, again, the crisis has changed a lot. Since 2015, we published the diaries of our executive board members so you can see whom they met and whom they talked to. Um, we have um, also published the so-called accounts, basically the minutes of our governing council uh, meetings. And we have um, tried to uh, uh, be much more transparent and to, as um, Jonas said, also to use our extremely productive and serious um, dialogue with um, ICON and the uh, monetary uh, dialogue with our president coming uh, four times a year to, to, to um, Brussels and Strasbourg and many, many technical meetings tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, also at, at the parliament in ICON so, um, to, to, to um, to, to listen and, and to, to be present. So there are, there are really, uh, let's say, many facets of this transparency. Um, we can always improve, but we take it extremely seriously because we are accountable to the people also. And basically, I think uh, I, I pick out two, two that were discussed by the speakers uh, um, before. And, and the first one is, uh, Stan said, uh, we shouldn't blame the ECB for uh, things that happened before the crisis, before 2008, but he uh, painted a more nuanced picture on, on whether to blame the ECB or not after the crisis. Uh, one, I'll think, uh, one important thing to realize, in my opinion, is that, uh, yes, the ECB uh, uh, um, searched for the boundaries of its, of its mandate and may even have, may even have stretched its, its mandate, uh, after the crisis, however, it, it, it needed to do so only uh, because there was lack of reform um, uh, by politicians of, uh, of the Eurozone. Uh, and not so much the politicians here at the table, but uh, mostly uh, national politicians. And there was lack of a banking union and still today uh, the banking union is not finished. Um, reforms uh, of the, the fiscal rules uh, are very difficult to accomplish. 
um, uh, more uh, more synchronized uh, economic developments in the eurozone, a more more synchronized cycle in the eurozone, and, and there are many reforms there, but it's also stalling. So basically, because there was room there that politicians didn't take, the ECB was obliged to step in to stabilize the eurozone. Uh, and in fact, the ECB did so only uh, when, when Draghi made his famous speech in 2012 and he said, I will do whatever it takes to save the euro and believe me, it will be enough. He only did so after politicians agreed to start work on the banking union. Only then uh, did Draghi say, well, okay, now I have the room, the mandate to indeed uh, make this commitment. So I think that, that it, it's important when, uh, when talking about blame, and, and it's always difficult to do the blame game, um, uh, it, it's, it's not the that the ECB acted on its own, it really uh, felt the need to fill um, uh, a vacuum, basically. Now, the, the other topic that I would like to, to discuss uh, in my introduction is, is that of, of uh, secure money, or uh, uh, central bank digital currency, sovereign money, uh, or a Volgeld, uh, we have the Volgeld referendum coming up in uh, Switzerland on the 10th of June. Um, it, it's a very complicated uh, topic, uh, which means indeed that you dis should discuss it extensively, uh, because there are many misunderstandings about it, and even some people, and luckily I haven't heard those today here, but even some people think that money creation is a conspiracy theory, uh, which, uh, which in my view it is not, uh, <laughs> I should say. Uh, but it is difficult, and uh, uh, I should admit that even within the bank that I work, uh, if I would to, uh, were to hold a survey uh, among bank employees with the question, do banks create money, uh, then uh, I don't think I would get a 100% response, yes, we do. Uh, so, yes, there is education to do on how the money system works, um, and, and I am sympathetic to the idea of, of, of secure money or, or, or sovereign money. Uh, I think that if you were to create a, the, the, the monetary financial system today from scratch, then you would probably exclude physical cash because it's, uh, it's very easy to do criminal transactions with it, it's easy to, uh, to counterfeit, uh, and you would probably include central bank digital currency and because the idea of, of being able to deposit money with a central bank uh, which is safe uh, and where you can trust it, uh, at least in normal circumstances, uh, is a very appealing idea. However, I, I do think that the big, the big issue here is uh, if, you were, uh, if you want to accomplish such a system is how to transition from the current system. And because in the current system, it's, it's a totally different system, private money creation. In fact, the role of finance, uh, the role of bank finance, especially in the Euro European economy is pivotal. Uh, the European economy depends on bank finance. And if you start to experiment with that, you really have to know what you are doing. I'm not saying it's impossible, to, but you really have to be sure what you are doing. Um, and, and one issue that I see is that, um, in my view, it's not the case that, that if you start with secure money that you can abolish all regulation. And why is that the case? Because money is on the liability side of commercial banks. It's, it's, a, it's a liability that banks create when they lend. Uh, while most financial crises, if not all financial crises, do not stem from money creation, they stem from uh, an overextension of credit. And credit is on the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. And yes, they are very much related, but in my view, the, the causation runs from credit to money and not the other way around. So I am afraid that if you, uh, uh, do this reform, uh, you um, um, basically separate uh, money creation and bring it to the central bank and you leave credit creation in private sector and then you liberal liberalize the, the credit creation totally, then uh, you will get runaway uh, credit creation and we will uh, move towards the next financial crisis, in fact, very soon. And in fact, we have experience with that because if you look in 2008, what started the financial crisis in the US was in fact the shadow banking channel, and which is basically a form of credit creation without, or a, a form of lending, I should say, without money creation. So it is very much possible, uh, and in fact it was the main channel uh, in which the, the crisis in the US uh, uh, started. Now, I mean, we can debate this for hours, but uh, we will not. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's just to say that, that I don't think that secure money is, is the answer to, to every problem, and in fact, I think it could even exacerbate this problem of uh, credit that we have. Let's leave it at that for now. 
Thank you so much. I think that you know we really want to hear from all of you, and I think in the spirit of doing things a bit differently, which is what Positive Money likes to do, um, you've heard a lot of uh, different thoughts from wide-ranging topics such as what is central banking about, accountability, what is money, sustainable finance, diversity in central banking, um, the public getting engaged, digital cash, um, sovereign money that I think it's maybe time just to take a couple of minutes. I'm going to ask you just to turn to the person next to you and just have a, a, like a two-minute chat about something that you've heard that you found interesting. And then I'm going to come back to you and take questions from the floor. So it's really not going to be very long, but it's just a time for you to digest some of what you've heard with the person next to you. Go for it. Uh, hi there, I'm Eric Lonergan, I'm a European citizen. Uh, I'll try and keep it spicy and brief. I have a question f uh, with respect to the ECB. So, absolutely has a primary objective, which is price stability, but also simultaneously has huge flexibility, in fact, more flexibility than any other central bank in pursuit of flight price, flex uh, price stability. And if we look at existing programs, they have both um, exercised... Uh, the exclusions of certain sectors of the economy. For example, the Teltros, people may be familiar, are not allowed to be extended to housing, which is a sectoral exclusion. Similarly, the ECB quite rightly adopts best practice and best practice from the private sector, for example, in its investment portfolios uh, in terms of the access to credit ratings. Um, those credit ratings, it elects often to use third parties to be the provider of credit ratings. So it seems to me an entirely reasonable request that its investment portfolios under QE would similarly follow best practice of, for example, the private sector fund management industry. And so logically could simply use best practice for sustainable development impact investing. And if it deems that to be contentious, so its, it's objective is not to... Uh, uh, diverge away from price stability, but simply in the um, implementation of its policies, it just adheres to best practice. And if there's ambiguity as to what is best practice, um, then it, it could request uh, the authority or the advice from, say, the European Parliament in pursuit of that. So I would have thought uh, impact investing uh, criteria for the sustainable development goals being applied to investment portfolios is really no different to excluding housing from a Teltro or using you know, Moody's and Standards and Poor's to do credit ratings. Great, thank you. We're going to take a couple more before I go to the panel. So there's one in the middle there. And is there another hand up? Okay, great. And we'll come to the front here afterwards. My name is uh, Diederik van Wassena. I work for um, ING, a European bank. Hence my interest in what happens in uh, Europe, but I'm also, like the previous speaker, a, um, a European citizen. Um, the, the, the thing is that we, when you're talking about um, should we revisit uh, the ECB and its mandate, I think, um, I think uh, Turner's alluded to that as well. I think we should allow first uh, ECB to fulfill its uh, present mission, and for that we need to complete the banking union, because uh, it's very difficult to evaluate something that is based on a not uh, fully constructed house. Is, is the foundation okay? Maybe, but uh, the, one of the pillars is missing, and therefore perhaps uh, we cannot really judge the effectiveness. So that's, that's my first remark. The second remark is, if you talk about a higher degree of um, say, democratic control over the dealings of an ECB, uh, perhaps uh, you would introduce a form of short-term thinking over something that is not necessarily helped by short-term thinking all the time. Uh, banks, central banks should be free to basically uh, look at the, and determine their own horizon when it comes to decision-making. But when one would introduce a form of a higher degree of democracy in in the central bank. I would start with Europe itself, with the core, and not with the uh, with something that is operating out of that, like a central bank. And maybe finally, um, the um, um, the I think what the ECB has shown over the last couple of years is, uh, in particular, for banks that operate on a cross-border basis like ours, uh, a much better degree of supervision. Um, 
And I hope that if there is a new crisis, and I agree with everybody that there will be a new crisis, but the question is when, and it could be another 50 years, could be next year, nobody knows, and we don't know what form it will take. I think uh, what a next crisis will show that with what we have in place now, and with also the build-up of the, the other institutional uh, mechanisms like the resolution mechanism and the, the deposit guarantee systems that are being built up in the member states. There will be a much higher degree of resilience, in, at least when it would take a form that we are a bit used to. The problem is, of course, nobody knows what the next crisis will look like. Thank you. Thank you. And one down here. Uh, yeah, yesterday, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was uh, grilled a little bit by the by uh, a group of uh, military of uh, members of parliament, and um, I I was wondering if you could uh, foresee the the a competition for the central bank as a community like Facebook that uh, once Facebook for example, will issue a Facebook coin, like a Bitcoin, and a Facebook bank, uh, could it actually be uh, become a, a major competition to the role of the central bank, the, the classical central bank that is today? Thank you. Thank you. So we've had three brilliant questions, and um, the first two are kind of connected a bit on the ECB and its mandate. Um, you know, in, even within its mandate, it could be using more innovative tools, uh, especially when you look at how it's choosing which um, corporate bonds to buy, thinking about impact investing, sustainable development goals. The second question around more of the mandate, um, potentially if there's another crisis coming, you know, what's in place to solve that? And the third one around, you know, is there a threat to central banks' um, power in a way from um, private currencies where they're coming from? Facebook or where else. So I think we'll go to Boris first, if that's okay, from the ECB, and then we'll take comments from all the panelists. Yeah, thank you, indeed. Very good question. So, yeah, best practices is something which is um, very important also for central banks. In our case, it's both on the monetary policy and the supervisory side, it's quite clear. We um, have one objective, which uh, the treaty gives us, the people of Europe give us, try stability. And um, we developed to QE um, with a view to, to ensuring and to reaching our goal of price stability. And this, uh, for reasons of efficiency, this is our objective. So the sustainability objective to which the ECB indeed also adheres can be fulfilled provided that the first primary objective, because we have one objective, is fulfilled. So this is, let's say, um, for the monetary policy operation, how it functions. As I said, for our own operations, can be different. Our own funds, uh, we can be much more, um, let's say, focused on on on, on green uh, green assets. And then there's also, of course also a definition issue: what is exactly a green asset? And I would be in pain to to give you a very very clear definition. So we are all working on that. And the second point I wanted just to, to, to mention is uh, regarding banking union. And I totally agree uh, that um, banking union is not complete and um, we are um, very much um, advocating uh, the third pillar. So we have the supervisory pillar, we have the resolution pillar since uh, 2014 uh, and 2015 respectively. And we need the third pillar, so a European deposit insurance guarantee. We are very much advocating this also um, with a view to um, the upcoming European Council. It is um, of key uh, also importance for, for our supervisory task to have uh, this third pillar. And, uh, and Mr. Draghi even made a speech uh, last week again on this. And, and, and um, it is indeed something we are concentrating our energy on because it is um, key for monetary union and banking union. Great. We can bring Molly in to respond. I want to start by saying I'm also a European citizen and I'm doing everything I can to make sure I'll be a European citizen after March next year by stopping Brexit. <laughs> um, yes, I, I totally take your point, Eric. I think there's a sort of 
understanding that the ECB is is neutral in its behaviour, is politically neutral, but it's making decisions all the time that have a political impact, as I said in my introductory remarks. And obviously, although its um, first priority is price stability, I think by building up stranded assets, by buying bonds uh, from fossil fuel companies, it is actually introducing instability into the system. So for that reason, regardless of whether you think it's a good idea um, politically or environmentally, I think just in terms of stability of banking, it's, it's not a good idea. And actually, in my report, we, um, we do argue that um, we should that the, the central bank does have guidelines and it should extend those guidelines in the direction of sustainability and eventually towards all ESG goals. And I think that's that's an attempt to say that actually it's already not operating in a, in a neutral way and we do need to have guidelines that, that are discussed with the people of Europe and initially with the European politicians in the parliament. And we have established through questioning, Draghi, through the dialogue and through our letters that um, the ECB is already bound by the Paris targets. So it, it shouldn't be buying... Um, assets from fossil fuel companies, in my view. Uh, then just the, the point about the central banking and, and the banking union and so on. I, I mean, I argued against Britain joining the euro. And the reason was it's quite clear that if you join a, a single currency, you're giving away, away a lot of sovereignty. And I personally didn't want to give away that sovereignty. And, but I think many countries in Europe, that argument was simply not clear. And so the, the political consequences of being a single currency were not argued through with people and they're not prepared to accept them, especially the fiscal transfers. And that has a built-in instability to the Eurozone project. And I think, I think that was sleight of hand by some of the politicians at the time who were rushing ahead of where the European people were. And I think it's built up enormous problems, which, I mean, fair enough, banking union, but, you know, we need to we need to explain to people that if you're part of the same financial system, then fiscal transfers will be necessary, that you will be responsible for other countries' debts. That's what being a single currency area means. And I'm afraid, you know, the, the, the polity in various European countries is not prepared to accept that, and they were not prepared through education to understand that's what they were doing. Um, I just raise a point about um, ECB and long-term thinking, because my conviction, again, is that if the ECB was engaged in long-term thinking, it would be committing to sustainability. And I think the way the banking and monetary system operates at the moment, it, it, as, as Mark Carney has argued, it does suffer from the tragedy of horizons. It does not think long-term enough to protect um, life on the planet. Um, and just on Zuckerberg, I was actually... I managed to sneak down and get into the VIP entrance where he came in. I was doing a media thing down there. And when he entered the parliament, he looked absolutely terrified. And although he wasn't grilled as effectively as I would have liked, I think he's already way out of his depth. And I wouldn't wish taking on a global bank on him as well. <laughs> Thanks, Joanna. It's, it's, it's true that the uh, primary objective of the ECB is uh, price stability. But it's true that in the Article 2 of the ECB Statute and in the Article 127 and 128 uh, uh, of the treaty, it's clear that the ECB must support the general economic policy of the Union, of course, without prejudice of uh, its primary objective. But I think that in the treaties, there are room to combine the primary objective with other, uh, with other objectives, because the ECB has to support the general economic policy of the Union. In any case, even the mandate is, or, the, or at least the, the primary objective is, is clear, it's true that the implementation of this mandate is in some way uh, self-regulation of the ECB. Because in the treaty, it's, it's not, it's, it's not uh, written that uh, stability, price stability is 2% uh, of the consumer prices. So uh, even in the current, in the current system, no, we will have to discuss why uh, consumer prices are the best uh, objective to define uh, stability uh, prices. Because uh, maybe we will have to introduce uh, asset prices uh, or at least uh, real estate prices. We'll have to discuss about uh, GDP deflator or uh, even a uh, price level. Uh, because, for example, last year, Blanchard and other economists published uh, a paper in which they defended that uh, stability prices will, will have to uh, be uncharged, not to the inflections, but 
to the price level. That is not exactly the, the same. And, and for example, this was defended by Blanchard, former uh, chief economist of uh, AMF. So I, I think that uh, even in the treaty, uh, the objective, the primary objective is clear. In the treaty, there is room to uh, complement this, this objective with other uh, objectives. And the, the way that this objective is uh, implement, implemented nowadays is self-regulated uh, by the ECB. And, and I think that uh, in the parliament, we will have to discuss if the current uh, definition of price stability is the best way to, to, to uncharge uh, inflection expectation, even in the current, in the current framework. Uh, a part of this uh, point, um, no, the, the monetary union does not work uh, properly. No, we will have to discuss how we could uh, create another uh, monetary system with uh, sovereign money or secure money, but it's clear that the current framework does not work uh, because our monetary union is uncompleted. No, and uh, we need, as our colleagues in this, uh, in this panel, we need a European deposit uh, insurance scheme. You know, we need uh, a fiscal bus stops. And, and for example, this type of instruments uh, will be useless in the uh, sovereign money uh, concept or framework. So uh, as I said before in my first speech, I, I think that in the short term, we have many things to do, even in the current system. We have to complete uh, the banking union and when we uh, complete the banking union, maybe we will have to discuss the mandate of the ECB, even in the current system. And uh, apart from this debate, of course, we have to discuss and debate about sovereign money as we are uh, doing uh, at this moment. Uh, on Facebook, uh, no, Facebook and another fintechs or social networks is clear uh, challenges from, uh, to the monetary policy and for us as uh, rule makers. Uh, but maybe in the, in the sovereign money framework, if Facebook does not take deposits, maybe they could work uh, free uh, and without regulation in this new uh, conceptual framework, maybe. <laughs> Just quickly then uh, from uh, Tonis and then Annalise. Thanks, yeah, maybe also reacting on the idea of Facebook issuing a, uh, a currency uh, and, and, and could that lead to a situation where you have many competing currencies? Uh, I think yes, uh, to today we have with uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies the technical ability, I mean, everybody can issue a coin. Uh, you need to pro be able to program a bit, but then you can just uh, copy paste Bitcoin code and start your own coin. Um, uh, so theoretically we could move to a situation where uh, uh, everybody could issue their own coin. Uh, however, we do have historical experience with how such things tend to end and for that we need to turn to the United States in the 19th century uh, where we had some periods of what was called free banking uh, where basically uh, every town in the, in the West uh, had a saloon, a sheriff's office and a bank and these banks were more or less unregulated and they issued their own banknotes. Some banks were uh, 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 very good and very stable, but some banks were not, and some banks were uh, playing out crooks. And we're seeing the same in, in today's cryptocurrency space, uh, that, that, that there is no supervision, no regulation, and you're really on your own uh, in, in judging which coin can I trust and which can I, uh, uh, can I don't trust. So I think there is some merit in having uh, uh, a, a generally regulated currency, a single currency, uh, whether sovereign or uh, privately issued, uh, at least one currency that, that you can rely upon. Uh, to the democratic control might lead to short-term thinking because I think it's a really um, prevalent argument out there. So, so, um, so you're referencing the uh, actually the economic papers like the Alicina and Summers that I mentioned here that suggested that uh, independence leads to low interest rates from the 90s. But um, I think there's been quite a lot of good research since then that has suggested that just because. Thank you. Um, just because there's a correlation between independence and price stability does not mean that there's a causation. And in, there's a number of papers that suggest the causation actually goes the other direction, so that it's actually price stability leads to central bank independence. 
Um, that's point number one. But more importantly, perhaps, um, I'm just uh, referencing here Adam Posen's work, where Adam has made the argument that um, you know, he's asked the question, independence from whom, for what purpose? And he said, even when central banks have a great deal of independence from the political process, that there's no democratic control, they're not independent from the markets, from the banks. That is, their legitimacy and their ability to act depends on getting the consent and buy-in of the big banks. And that means that they're not acting completely rationally with long-term uh, horizons because, of course, we know that the market participants don't have long-term horizons. So that's the larger thing. But I think, um, you know, the, 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 what the crisis taught us is that the danger is a situation where you have a lot of silo thinking and crowd, uh, crowd uh, thinking. And the best way to get around that, as you mentioned, is to ask people to explain themselves to people that they don't normally talk to. And so I thought your example was really wonderful about, perhaps it doesn't even change the policy, but the fact of having to make reasons is very, very important to broadening one's perspective. So that's why I think um, that's, that's um, really essential, that, the, that there be as much communication with elected officials as possible. Now, I think your second point, is really important. I completely agree that um, that the politicians have not done their part, and so it's a little bit unfair to ask so much of central bankers because they're really filling in the gaps where the politicians have failed us. Um, but that's precisely why I want to suggest that you know the argument that central bankers sometimes make that look, I'll just stick within the boundaries of what the legislator has told me to do, and if you have a problem, go to the legislature is not insufficient and sometimes even a little bit disingenuous because we all know that the legislatures are not going to act immediately. And so if that's not going to happen, then uh, what fills the gap? And that's where engaging with the public is pretty important. Okay, um, my name is Barb Jacobson. I'm from Unconditional Basic Income Europe. Um, I'm not asking you about that, but I'm, I think the thing that's at the top of my mind at the moment is uh, potential war. We've heard a lot about the environment. Um, I think people have kind of got with QE and then also now with, with, you know, there's always enough money for QE and there's always enough money for war. So what is the ECB's potential role perhaps in, in maybe helping politicians grow a backbone in terms of like really crazy policy from the US? Um, because we're looking possibly at sanctions, you know, if the Iran agreement falls, then we're looking at sanctions, you know, we're looking at sanctions and all kinds of turmoil. Anyway, I just would like to know what the panel thinks about that. Hi, I'm Walter Aaltonen from Finland, Economic Democracy Finland organization. I would like to get back to the, um, how ECB should engage the public and Boris, you mentioned that <clears throat> you are going to be, uh, you are going to listen and be present, but I think that's not enough because you need to listen and react. And maybe you could think about that with some some points. Hey, hello, I'm Kai Moritz. I'm working for the European Parliament right now. Um, I have a question regarding the mentioned banking uniforms and uh, missing backstops, both on the fiscal side and the banking side. Um, we haven't seen significant EU reforms since the crisis, and we have the problem that the politics, like the council mostly, cannot agree on anything. That's, there's never been um, a monetary union with not a big centralized fiscal part. Is there any approach how to, in case there is no legislative uh, success in the future, how to completely separate this or mostly separate this without having backstops for banks and maybe also member states, but a centralized common currency? Um, I might open up a can of worms, um, but I haven't heard anyone uh, talking about uh, one of the reasons for the euro, I understood, was to protect the people, uh, to pre protect smaller uh, currencies against speculators on the um, currency markets um, and to have a stable currency. And I understand, as I understood it, central banks um, also uh, have a role to play 
in the currency markets as a last resort for um, now perhaps in the euro case that's less important for a small country because there are a lot of euros and a lot of dollars at the moment um, but suppose you go to full geld or um, a stable currency as proposed by positive money would that help um, or would you have to have an international agreement I haven't heard about the international implications because I think you can't do it alone to go to full geld or something like that uh, so last question I guess um my name is uh, Leo hoffmann Axel. I work for Transparency International, where I coordinate the Eurozone Governance Program. And we did a study on the ECB recently, where we inter alia recommended that the ECB uh, engage with the monetary dialogue in a more formalized way, and also uh, react to the annual resolution that the European Parliament prepares as a, a reaction to the ECB's annual report. Uh, now, we actually saw that the ECB did a reply to that resolution uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so my question here was, uh, given that basically I would like to connect it to some of the things that have been said uh, on the panel before, there was this very good example of the Danish central bank uh, engaging with critics head on by acknowledging uh, unknowns and by acknowledging the limits of their powers and so on. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Kisilevsky, you claimed, for example, that uh, you were close to the inflation target, which for years has manifestly not been the case. So maybe this is like a good example of, of uh, maybe, you know, trying to rebuild trust by just acknowledging when things don't go perfectly and when we are uh, insecure about the future of inflation and whether or not the monetary paradigm will be with us for much longer. Um, to tie it back with the monetary dialogue, uh, can you uh, imagine that maybe in future you'll uh, reply to the uh, European Parliament's report, um, let's say uh, paragraph by paragraph, because in this instance uh, you, the bank sort of cherry-picked the part of the report where it says that transparency has improved and then actually twists that around to say, which means that probably the part of the European Parliament resolution where it says we should improve on transparency has already been followed up on. So I thought that was not the, the most straightforward way of engaging with the Parliament, even though of course it's a great step forward that now there's these uh, replies being published. So some, some uh, light and shadow there. Thanks. Great. Honest, I bring them to you first. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I need to, to leave, so I, I apologize because I have to, to, to fly to Madrid now. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation. Uh, to, the f to the final questions, uh, I think that uh, there are many things that our colleagues from ECB will have to, to answer better than, than us. Uh, on monetary dialogue, uh, in the in the last uh, ECB draft uh, report of, of the Parliament, uh, we have introduced uh, some ideas to to improve uh, the current uh, model. Yeah, uh, in any case, uh, I think that part of the responsibility to to improve the, the monetary dialogue is is ours, is uh, from the European Parliament because, as you know, the current system is negotiating between the Parliament and the ECB. But even in the current framework, I think that there are uh, many things that we could do to, to improve the, uh, the control yeah, on uh, what ECB is doing. Uh, but in any case, in the report, there are, there are other ideas. Uh, and on the debate on the reform of the monetary union, I, I think that the banking union is, is, of course, is a must. But in any case, we need another type of fiscal uh, automatic uh, stabilizer. Yeah? So I, I think that with the banking union and, and with uh, any type of uh, fiscal automatic stabilizer, uh, stabilizer we, we, we could uh, live uh, with uh, the current uh, monetary union. Yeah, we know with the current, with, uh, no, with uh, the Eurozone. Uh, so in any case, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Positive Money. I think that these seminars are key to, to introduce new ideas, to introduce new concepts and new debates in the uh, established uh, debate that we have in the, in the parliament. And of course, we will have uh, another opportunities in the in the future to collaborate. So thank you very much, and thank you for my colleagues in this panel. I, I'm sorry, I apologize, but I need to fly. No problem. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> so I think we're going to continue along this in this direction, Boris. If you're okay to. So I will <coughs> follow your guidelines. One minute. So. Um, 
on the first question, geopolitics, what I can say, just to give a concrete example, is that uh, current trade discussions could possibly have um, impact on the real economy, and the real economy is of key interest um, to the ECB. Um, because it uh, determines also our monetary policy reaction function. So by definition, these, um, let's say, um, discussion at the international level with the US on trade are follow up, followed up um, also by our economists and, and, and monitored. But um, we are not a member state, we are a central bank, so this is, of course, um, different. The second question on the reaction, you say it's good to listen, but please react. Um, very two examples where we have reacted. There were for years some um, talks that the ECB should do more in terms of transparency and governing council. What is happening in this black box? We now publish the accounts, the minutes. It's a reaction thanks to the voices that were um, out here. And, and, and indeed, the gender thing, thank you, Molly, is exactly the same thing. Also, we react um, on the positive, let's say, or integrity also with the code of conduct. So there are many, many examples. So we are not like an ivory tower. We are not just listening. We are also acting. And last um, but not least, um, on, on Leo's question, um, what I was saying is uh, I was taking the average for the last 20 years because I said we are 20 years old so on inflation. So, and you say the ECB never, um, let's say, uh, recognizes its, uh, its error. I think I totally disagree. I mean, look at uh, even the press conference of our president when he says that he is uh, sometimes not um, uh, yet satisfied with the level of inflation and that we should reach our objective. So we are for sure um, not uh, auto-congratulating ourselves um, all the time. It's, um, you know, central banks as our more risk adverse people. So we are very prudent, but uh, we are um, very much uh, listening uh, to the public and indeed trying to improve our communication, our dialogue, also in the monetary dialogue, and we are ready to continue to do so. Uh, thanks. Well, on, on, on the question uh, about the threat of war, I think the only answer that a central banker can give within his remit is make money, not war. Uh, the, the second point, or a second point, a, a question by a gentleman uh, there in the middle, uh, which I didn't fully uh, get, but I think I translated uh, translate the question as what is needed to stabilize the monetary union or to, to get it to a sustainable footing. And I think, well, there are many discussions about that, and, and you, you no doubt know that, uh, academic discussions. Um, and, and I think there, there is a layer approach. Uh, and the more layers you implement successfully, the more stable the Eurozone is, and so the more uh, future-proof it is. And those layers are uh, labor mobility uh, between member states, capital mobility, but also, uh, as it's called in jargon, financial risk sharing uh, in the private sector. So banks uh, acting across borders, uh, but also the capital markets union, um, uh, and in the end also fiscal risk sharing. And I think the more of these layers you implement successfully, uh, the more stable uh, the Eurozone uh, will be. Uh, and, and final question about uh, uh, sovereign money and, and can you do that as a country on your own? Um, it hasn't been tested yet, so it's an empirical question, uh, but I think um, you have to distinguish also between the transition and the end state. I think in the end state, yes, it's possible as a small country to, uh, to have a, a sovereign money. Uh, let's say, uh, imagine a Switzerland in the end state with a sovereign money. I think the franc would even be a very strong currency because its money would be considered very safe because it's, it's all uh, uh, central bank money. Um, in the transition, I don't know. It, it's, it's indeed, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and I think if you were to implement Volgeld uh, uh, or, or secure money in a monetary union context, then you do run into the very difficult issue of the allocation of money supply because the central bank or the government, at least a, a government institution, decides on uh, the money supply, but it has to, al to be allocated across countries, across people, and that's, of course, a political question uh, that you have to agree upon. Thanks. Thank you. So um, a very interesting question about the relationship between the way we create money and war. Now, I think um, if we observe, if we just observe history, I think it's fairly clear that if you have a monetary system that depends on growth to keep it going, as our monetary system does, then when that growth stalls, you actually see a, a kind of conflict, a buildup of conflict. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing now. And I'm very sorry to say that nothing creates 
the demand for further growth than war. And this is exactly the point Keynes said when, you know, he said economies like to, uh, capitalist economies like to dig holes and fill them in again. And war is, a, is an incredibly efficient way of doing that. And then you have to recreate the money to, to pay for uh, the boom of rebuilding everything you trashed in the war. So I think we should see an important connection there. And it's a very important reason why we need to, to stabilize our money system. Another connection I will see, I see particularly in terms of Iran is the fact that I think the way the US is posturing in the world now is, is it should be making people lose confidence in the US as a stable economy and therefore in the US as the stable reserve currency. And um, I think that you know the European Central Bank should be proposing itself as the alternative stable currency with a stable polity attached. Um, and so, so I, I think it's, it's, it sounds like a question, well, how would we answer that question? But I think there are very important connections out there. And this is also partly why the euro was created, to, to increase the strength of Europe and to, to protect the smaller states of Europe against the sort of speculative attack that they've been seeing that weakened and destabilized them. So I've always seen the connection between currency and the power of a country. And therefore, there's also a connection between nationalism and war and the power of that country. So um, yeah, it's an interesting thing to reflect on. So thank you for asking that question. Um, I just wanted to say, in terms of stabilizing the Eurozone, that we spent ages in our group, in the Green Group, discussing a, a plan to do exactly that, and it's available on the website. I can't be sure that terribly many people read it, but uh, it's full of extremely good answers. It's not quite so easy to go out and argue that kind of um, policy platform with the public. And uh, I'm going to close now with my central banking joke, because I don't get a chance to bring this joke out very often. Um, so, the, uh, it's in terms of engagement, so it's in answer to the question about engagement. The Bank of England decided that they would engage with the public more, and they chose one of their deputy directors, who's called Charlie Bean. And it was a really good idea, except when he went out there, all the headlines said, Mr. Bean explains central banking. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I wasn't going to say anything about war, but then Tunis said, make money, not war, and I just have to react to that. So um, unfortunately, the history of most of the wars in, certainly in this, in the last century, uh, were, uh, were, were histories of wars financed by central banks printing money, making money to make war. Um, and there's a lot of discussion going on among central bankers in Japan, very serious discussion about central bank independence as important precisely as a, as a check on the possibility of history ever repeating itself, and they take that very seriously. And I think that's something to keep in mind uh, in our con own country as well, where at the same time as we're seeing the executive try to uh, question the authority and the independence of all bureaucrats, um, you, you, uh, you see a, a rise in uh, warmongering. So I think that's I think well taken. Um, and I just want to comment, um, just point out that I appreciate you raising the question of transnational questions here, because we haven't had that in our discussion. And I would um, really urge um, the activist community to think about central bank legitimacy and all these questions in a more transnational context, because clearly what you know, what the Federal Reserve does, for example, affects many people around the world outside the United States, and yet its mandate is defined as only to help American citizens, and therefore there needs to be some alliances across borders. Um, um, and finally, I'm just going to respond to the point, in response to the question from the gentleman about from Finland about um, speaking back. Um, um, I mean, sir, you, you raised many, I think, mentioned what many wonderful programs and they sound they are fantastic and really important and I think speaking in schools and so forth is all valuable things to do and having museums is important as well but um, those are all quite pedagogical um, activities and um, and I know you there are many other things that you're doing as well as you mentioned but uh, I think in addition to those very important things it would be great if we saw more opportunities for dialogues, frankly, like this one, where there can be a back and forth. And so both um, are important. Yeah, thanks.
Thank you so much. We'll be pleased to know that I stand between you and a drink. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly and just want to first of all thank you all for coming uh, and for sticking with us. We've had such a wide ranging discussion on how to make our money and banking more fair, more democratic and more sustainable. But I think the one thing we're all agreed on it is that it does need to be made more fair, more democratic and more sustainable. So I'd just like to thank uh, our, our speakers, Miguel, who hopefully will be staying around for a drink, uh, Annalise, Molly, Tonis, Boris, and obviously Jonas. And thank you very much for coming. And I think there's a drink next door. So please stay around and have a chat. Mm -hmm.